This is the Music Halls of Fame podcast. This week, we honor the year in music for 2000, along with a member of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame class of 2000. We also look at the case for putting Ted Nugent into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, plus our spotlight walk of fame is the Hollywood Walk of Fame in Hollywood, California. Before we get going with the podcast, like everyone tells you, please like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell so you'll know when these podcast episodes drop, which is usually every Thursday. Now, on to this week's episode. The year was 2000. In music, it was the year that the world survived the Y2K bug that was supposed to shut down all of the computers at midnight on New Year's Eve once the year hit double zero in everybody's computers. New metal and the boy band craze took hold as groups like Limp Bizkit, Papa Roach, and Kid Rock were sharing space with NSYNC, whose second album, No Strings Attached, moved them to superstardom status. Britney Spears also hit superstardom status with her Oops I Did It Again tour. Metallica sued Napster, Napster then became a subscription-based service, and Napster would shut itself down in 2001. 28 states sued record companies for price fixing on CDs. Prince changed his name back to Prince from that symbol that he had been using. Nine people died during an audience crush during a Pearl Jam performance at a festival in Denmark that year. Groups that formed in 2000 included Above and Beyond, The Zac Brown Band, Crash Diet, Fusebox, Los Lonely Boys, O-Town, and The Yeah, Yeah, Yeahs. Groups that called it quits in 2000, of course, before their inevitable reunions or announced their hiatus included The Spice Girls, Luscious Jackson, Candlebox, Rage Against the Machine, Fish, The Posies, Letters to Cleo, Primus, Skunk Anansi, The Smashing Pumpkins, Color Me Bad, All Saints, and Ben Folds Five. Most of those groups reformed later on in one form or another. The group presidents of the United States reformed in 2000, at least for a little while. Eminem had one of the biggest selling albums of 2000 with the Marshall Mathers LP. Other artists who had big albums that year included Britney Spears, Creed, Nelly, The Backstreet Boys, Dr. Dre, Destiny's Child, Santana, Coldplay, In Sync, Linkin Park, Limp Bizkit, Westlife, Enya, The Coors, Shaggy, along with greatest hits albums from Whitney Houston, Queen, and The Beatles. Radiohead released their classic album, Kid A, that year as well. Breathe by Faith Hill was one of the biggest songs of the year, followed by Santana Smooth and also his song Maria Maria, Joe's I Wanna Know, Vertical Horizons Everything You Want, Destiny Child's Say My Name, Savage Gardens I Knew I Loved You, Lone Star's Amazed, Bon Jovi's It's My Life, Matchbox 20's Bent, Madonna's Music, and Tony Braxton's He Wasn't Man Enough. In country music, Garth Brooks announced that he was done touring. That lasted for almost 20 years until his kids were old enough to not need him around as much. Meanwhile, Rural America TV network RFD Television started, which had mainly agricultural shows, but also had a lot of country music shows. Country music star and future Eagles band member Vince Gill and Christian pop music crossover superstar Amy Grant got married in 2000. Big albums for the year included Alan Jackson's When Somebody Loves You, Leanne Womack's I Hope You Dance, Joe D. Messina's Burn, two greatest hits albums from George Strait, one greatest hits album from Kenny Chesney, one greatest hits album from Tim McGraw, the Coyote Ugly soundtrack, and the Oh Brother, Where Art Thou soundtrack. Big singles included Faith Hill's Breathe and The Way You Love Me, Tim McGraw's My Best Friend and My Next 30 Years, Leanne Womack's I Hope You Dance, Kenny Rogers' Buy Me a Rose, Lone Star's What About Now, Aaron Tippin's Kiss This, John Michael Montgomery's The Little Girl, The Dixie Chicks, now known as The Chicks, Cowboy Take Me Away, Travis Tritt's Best of Intentions, and Alan Jackson's It Must Be Love. 
In hip-hop, the biggest albums were Eminem's The Marshall Mathers LP, Jay-Z's The Dynasty, Rock La Familia, Outkast's Stankonia, Snoop Dogg's The Last Meal, Mystical's Let's Get Ready, Wu-Tang Clan's The Wu, Ja Rule's Rule 336, Nelly's Country Grammar, Jurassic 5's Quality Control, Exhibit's Restless, and the Ride or Die Volume 2 compilation. The biggest singles included Eminem's The Real Slim Shady, Missy Elliott's Hot Boys, Nelly's Country Grammar, Jay-Z's I Just Want to Love You, and Big Pimpin', Dr. Dre's The Next Episode, and Forget About Dre, and Ice Cube's You Can Do It. In dance music, there were big albums like Paul Van Dyke's Out There and Back, Tiesto's Presents Magic Six Live in Amsterdam, Moby's Play, Fatboy Slims is Halfway Between the Gutter and the Stars, Nightmare on Wax's DJ Kicks, William Orbit's Pieces in a Modern Style, and Madonna's Music. There were two iconic songs that were released, mainly because of the fact that they still get played in sports stadiums worldwide to this very day. Darude's Sandstorm and Daft Punk's One More Time. Other big dance songs from the year included Underworld's Cowgirl, Moja's A Lady Hear Me Tonight, A Touch of Classes All Around the World, Sonique's Sky, Moby's Natural Blues, Fatboy Slim's Weapon of Choice, and also Star 69, Angelic's It's My Turn, and The Prodigy's Baby's Got a Temper. The top 10 DJs of the year, according to DJ Mag's annual poll, were Sasha, Paul Oakenfold, John Digweed, Paul Van Dyke, Carl Cox, Judge Jules, Danny Tenaglia, Fergie, Lisa Lashes, and Danny Howells. In Latin music, the biggest artists of the year included Mark Anthony, Sun by Four, Gloria Estefan, Carlos Vives, Christina Aguilera, A.B. Quintanilla, and Los Cumbias Kings. Also, Shakira, Enrique Iglesias, Ibrahim Ferrer, Gilberto Santa Rosa, Joan Sebastian, Los Angeles Azules, Los Temerarios, Banda El Recodo, and Ricardo Orjonia. Broadway musicals or revivals of musicals that opened in 2000 included Aida, The Dead, The Full Monty, Jane Eyre, The Music Man, and Susical The Musical. Musical films and documentaries that were released in 2000 included Almost Famous, Dancer in the Dark, Darling Darling, The Filth and the Fury, Song Catcher, Help, I'm a Fish, The Road to El Dorado, The Tigger Movie, The Fantastics, and Turn It Up. Artists who were born in 2000 included rappers 24 Karat Golden, Digga D, Lil Pump, and Young Lyric, along with singers Gabby Barrett, Willow Smith, Baby Ariel, Halle Bailey of Chloe and Halle, singer-songwriter B. Badubi, reggae singer Coffee, Surf Mesa, Haichin, and Yang Yang of NCT, producer Nick Mira, and Noah Cyrus. Artists who passed away in 2000 included singers Ofra Haza, Ian Dury, Kirsty McCall, Nasia Hassan, and Johnny Taylor, along with rappers Big Pun and Joe C., country music singer Jimmy Davis, pianist Victor Borga, Benjamin Orr of the Cars, DJ Screw, Screamin' Jay Hawkins, Tito Puente, Dennis Danell of Social Distortion, saxophonist Stanley Turrentine, pop staples of the staple singers and composer Jack Nitsky. In award ceremonies for the music of 2000, Steely Dan won Album of the Year at the Grammy Awards for Two Against Nature. U2 won Record and Song of the Year for Beautiful Day, and Shelby Lynn won Best New Artist. Eminem's music video for the song The Real Slim Shady won Video of the Year at the MTV Video Music Awards. During that ceremony, Rage Against the Machines' Tim Comerford climbed the scaffolding on the stage during Limp Bizkit's performance. That's really the only memorable part of that entire ceremony. At the American Music Awards, Tony Braxton, Creed, The Backstreet Boys, Dr. Dre, Faith Hill, and Enrique Iglesias were the big winners. At the Billboard Music Awards, Destiny's Child won Artist of the Year. 
Destiny's Child and Jay-Z won Entertainers of the Year at the Soul Train Music Awards. Faith Hill, Garth Brooks, and In Sync won the music categories at the People's Choice Awards. At the Eurovision Singing Contest, which was held that year in Stockholm, Sweden, the Olsen Brothers from the country of Denmark won for the song Fly on the Wings of Love. The Dixie Chicks, now known as the Chicks, won Entertainer of the Year at the Country Music Association Awards, and Shania Twain won Entertainer of the Year at the Academy of Country Music Awards. Coldplay won Best British Album for Parachutes, and Robbie Williams won Best Song for Rock DJ at the Brit Awards. The Bare Naked Ladies won Best Album for Maroon, while Nelly Furtado won Best Song for I'm Like a Bird at the Juno Awards. Killing Heidi won Album of the Year for Reflector, and Madison Avenue won Single of the Year for Don't Call Me Baby at the Aria Music Awards. At the Tony Awards, Contact won Best Musical and Kiss Me Kate won Best Revival of a Musical. The Pulitzer Prize for Music was won by Louis Spartlin for Life is a Dream, Opera in Three Acts, Act Two, Concert Version. Musically, at the Academy Awards, Bob Dylan won Best Song for Things Have Changed from the movie Wonder Boys, and Tan Dunn won Best Original Score for Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. Badly Drum Boy won the Mercury Music Prize for the album The Hour of Bewilder Beast. The Rock and Roll Hall of Fame induction ceremony took place on March 6th at the Old Waldorf Astoria Hotel in New York City. At the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame induction ceremony, the Sidemen category was introduced for the very first time. The category was given to, quote, honor the musicians who were out of the spotlight who performed as backup musicians for major musicians, either in recording sessions or in concert, end quote. Drummer Hal Blaine, saxophonist King Curtis, bass guitarist James Jamerson, guitarist Scotty Moore, and drummer Earl Palmer were the first inductees into that category. The category was discontinued after 2009 and instead was merged into the Award for Musical Excellence category. In 2000, during that ceremony, legendary record executive Clive Davis was inducted into the non-performers category. Nat King Cole and Billie Holiday were inducted into the early influencers category. And in the performers category, the hall inducted Eric Clapton, Earth, Wind & Fire, The Loving Spoonful, Bonnie Raitt, James Taylor, and this next group. The group The Moon Glows made their name in the very beginnings of the early rock and roll era of the 1950s, before artists like Elvis Presley, Fats Domino, and Chuck Berry gave rock its swagger. The group started out as the duo of Louisville, Kentucky friends Harvey Fuqua and Bobby Lester, who got together in 1949 after they both got out of the Army. A couple of years later, Harvey decided to move to Cleveland, Ohio, where he started the group The Crazy Sounds with Danny Coggins and Prentice Barnes. Later in the year, Bobby moved to Cleveland and joined the group. The next year, in 1952, The Crazy Sounds auditioned at a club in Cleveland for a slot on the club's lineup. The club owners knew a local radio DJ at the time who was making a name for himself, Rock and Roll Hall of Famer Alan Freed. The club owners got Alan to listen to the crazy sounds, and once Alan did, he became the group's manager. The first thing that Alan did as manager was to change the name of the group from the crazy sounds to the moon glows. The next thing that he did was to sign them to his record label, Champagne. The group wasn't successful at first, and Danny ended up leaving the group, so they replaced Danny with Alexander Walton, who went by the name Peter Graves. The Moon Glows started recording for the Chance record label, but those recordings didn't pan out too well on the charts either. And then fate changed things. In 1953, Alan Freed started a radio show on WINS Radio in New York City. The show was extremely popular. And what it meant for the Moon Glows was that they ended up gaining exposure on the show, which led to the group getting a recording contract with Chess Records. It was at Chess Records that the group hit pay dirt. 
The first song of theirs that Chess released was Sincerely in 1954 for the Rock, Rock, Rock movie soundtrack. The song shot up to number one on the R&B charts, and a more watered-down version of the song became a big hit for the group, the McGuire Sisters. Sincerely was followed up by Most of All and We Go Together, which also became hits. There were some other shifts with various members going in and out of the group. However, when Billy Johnson joined the group in 1955, which added a guitarist to the vocal group, the lineup that is considered the classic lineup became Bobby Lester, Harvey Fuqua, Billy Johnson, Pete Graves, and Prentice Barnes. During the group's initial run from 1953 to 1958, the Moon Glows had seven songs hit the top 15 on the R&B charts. Sincerely, most of all, we go together, When I'm With You, Seesaw, Please Send Me Someone to Love, and The Ten Commandments of Love. Four of those songs hit the top 40 on the pop charts, although the highest to chart on the pop charts was Sincerely, which topped out at number 20. After finishing their recording contract in late 1958, the group went their separate ways, with Harvey Fuqua having the most success. In fact, it was Harvey who helped to discover another future Rock and Roll Hall of Famer, Marvin Gaye. Harvey took Marvin's group at the time, the Marquis, brought in Chuck Barksdale from the group The Dells, renamed the group Harvey and the New Moon Glows. That version of the Moon Glows recorded until late 1960 when Marvin went to Detroit and started working for the Motown record label. Harvey soon followed Marvin to Detroit and worked with Motown during the label's heyday in the 1960s. Fuqua and Lester separately got other versions of the Moon Glows together over the next couple of decades, going through at least 20 different group members collectively. Variations of the group toured here and there for a few years at a time until each classic lineup member passed away, mainly from cancer, strangely enough. Fuqua was the last one of the classic lineup to pass away in 2010. Inducted into the hall by Paul Simon of Class of 1990 inductees Simon and Garfunkel, and also in 2001 as a solo artist, Harvey Fuqua, Bobby Lester, Peter Graves, Prentice Barnes, and Billy Johnson. The Moon Glows inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame Class of 2000, and we have put their music onto this week's podcast playlist, the link to which is in the show notes. Before we go any further, we'd like to tell you that there is now a Music History In-Depth podcast where we go more in-depth on a few of the events that happened in music history for that particular week. The Music History In-Depth podcast drops every Tuesday on YouTube or wherever you get your podcast from, as does our Music History Today podcast, which goes over the daily events in music history. The Music History Today podcast drops daily, including weekends, on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. Now, back to this podcast. This week, we're going to take a look at the case for putting Ted Nugent into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. A few years ago, Ted gave an interview where he said that, much like Motley Crue, he was never going to get into the hall. In Motley Crue's case, they were told that it was because of their behavior concerning women back in the 1980s. In Ted's case, he says that it was all because of his politics. Now, I'm not a guy who falls on either side of the whole woke, non-woke debate when it comes to musicians. I'm a live and let live type of guy. I'm a moderate, actually. You go do you. Don't matter to me. I've also, over the decades, have come to separate an artist as an artist and an artist as a human being. I've spoken about Ted's chances of being inducted a few years ago on an earlier version of this podcast, and now I'm going to revisit this subject, despite how I feel about him personally, because full disclosure, I personally think that the guy is an a no, not going to swear. I would just simply say that he's really not a nice guy. He is a racist, he's misogynistic, way too far to the right extremist, 
now, now still not going to swear. However, be that as it may, as an artist, and strictly as an artist, does Ted have an argument for being inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? So, as we always do, let's go to the tail of the tape using his solo career and not including any of the bands that he's been in, like Damn Yankees, for instance. Ted has released 16 studio albums, 8 live albums, 16 compilation albums. Of those, 5 of his albums went platinum, with 4 of those going double and triple platinum. 5 hit the top 20 on the album's charts, but none of them hit the top 10. As far as his singles went, he released 20 of those. Of those, 3 hit the top 40 with his best-known song, 1977's Catch Scratch Fever, doing the best at number 30. His other best-known songs didn't do well in the charts. 1978's Yank Me Crank Me hit number 58, and 1980's Wango Tango hit number 86. All right, those aren't terrible stats, and artists with worse commercial success have gotten inducted. So, let's look at his influence. As far as I can tell, there's been extremely few artists who have publicly said that his music influenced them. Where he can't be touched, though, is when he plays live. Because, honestly, that dude can flat out own a crowd and put on one of the best shows that I've ever seen. And it is no wonder that the albums that have sold double and triple platinum for the guy have been the live albums. With a decent resume, we'll say, even taking in his lack of influence into account, does he deserve to be inducted? Well, at this point, kinda, yeah. In the 1970s and 80s, he was known as one of the best live guitarists out there. In the current version of Who Gets Into the Hall, he should, in a slow year at least, get in. However, he is right that his politics will keep him out. Sort of. There's also that other pesky problem that he never brings up when he rails against the hall. His views and alleged involvement with underage girls back in the 1970s. Just Google them. I'm not even going to talk about them here. There have been other artists who are in the hall who have also had the same rumors and allegations about them. However, Nugent's alleged behavior might be a reason why Ted has not been taken seriously for consideration. So, with everything I've said, I will say that I have now completely changed my opinion from a few years ago about whether Ted Nugent deserves to get into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. When I first posed this question a few years ago, I said absolutely not. Now I say yes. At the very least, he deserves consideration. However, he won't get in, both for the political reasons that he said and more probably for his alleged behavior in the 1970s. Besides, the dude really is a piece of sh... Nope, 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 nope. Not gonna swear. Not gonna swear at all. However... We did put his music onto this week's podcast playlist so you can decide for yourself and check it out. There are many walks of fame in the world. There's the Black Music and Entertainment Walk of Fame in Atlanta, Georgia, the Music City Walk of Fame in Nashville, Tennessee. There's even a Music Walk of Fame in Amy Winehouse's old neighborhood in Camden, London, England, and a Walk of Fame in Brighton, England. However, when you think of Walks of Fame, you really only think of one. It's the most famous Walk of Fame of them all. It's the Hollywood Walk of Fame. The idea for the walk was dreamed up by E.M. Stewart, who was president of the Hollywood Chamber of Commerce in 1953. People think that the idea for having stars came from the Hollywood Hotel, which had stars on the ceiling of their living room. The final parameters for the project were agreed upon in 1955 and presented to the Los Angeles City Council in 1956, and construction for the walk started in 1958 and ended in 1960. There were eight people who were supposed to be given stars first. Olive Borden, Ronald Coleman... Louise Frizenda, Preston Foster, Burt Lancaster, Edward Sedgwick, 
Ernest Torrance, and Joanne Woodward. However, director Stanley Kramer is credited with having his star installed on the actual Walk of Fame first on March 28, 1960. Popular myth is that Joanne Woodward was the first star, but she was the first person to be photographed posing with her star, so that myth kind of stuck. The walk covers 1.3 miles down 15 blocks of Hollywood Boulevard with three blocks of Vine Street as space permits. As of September 26, 2024, there were 2,790 stars. The stars are awarded in five different categories, film, television, theater slash live performance, radio, and music. For our podcast, we will only be dealing with artists who were awarded in at least the radio and music categories. People who get stars these days now have to pay $50,000 for the upkeep to the star. And every year, the Chamber of Commerce gets over 200 names for consideration for a star, but only award 20 to 24 stars during a normal year. There has only been one star that was not put on a sidewalk, Muhammad Ali the greatest, because he didn't want it to be walked on because he was a champion. He was inducted into the theater slash live performance category, and his star is on a wall at Hollywood in Highland at 6801 Hollywood Boulevard, if you're in the area and ever want to check it out. There have also been special stars given out to people who were part of the Hollywood community, such as former Los Angeles mayor, the late Tom Bradley, and honorary mayor of Hollywood and the guy most associated with promoting the Walk of Fame, the late great Johnny Grant. There have been stars given as well to people who were not entertainers, but who had done important things, such as the crew of Apollo 11. Usually, those stars, much like Muhammad Ali's, are put in the live performance category, mainly because they showed up on television. There have been two presidents who were given stars, Ronald Reagan and Donald Trump. Reagan was given one for his radio and acting career before he became president, and Trump because of his TV show, The Apprentice. Only one star so far in the history of the Walk of Fame has ever been considered for removal from the Walk of Fame, Donald Trump's. As of yet, no final decision has been made about removing it, although it pops up every now and then. Politics, you know. Billy Idol was born William Michael Albert Broad on November 30th, 1955 in Stanmore, Middlesex, England, UK, United Kingdom. His first group was the British punk rock group Chelsea. Then he became the lead singer of the popular punk rock band Generation X. Generation X released three albums on Chrysalis Records, but then broke up. Billy took everything he learned during his time on the London punk rock scene and developed an extremely successful solo career once he left England for New York City and hooked up with his partner in crime, Mr. Steve Stevens, on guitar. What also helped Billy's career was the fledgling cable music channel that started up when Billy made his solo debut, MTV. MTV desperately needed music videos, and Billy was making them, so MTV put them into heavy rotation. His punk rock spiked hair look with dance rock songs were perfect for the channel, and he became one of the channel's first big superstars. Billy put out an EP called Don't Stop in 1981, which had a song that Billy originally recorded with Generation X called Dancing With Myself. He then released a self-titled album in 1982. The album was a huge hit, with the songs White Wedding, Hot in the City, which became the theme song for the 21 Jump Street spinoff show on television called Booker, which had Richard Grieco. little trivia for you along with a re-release of Dancing With Myself. All those songs became big hits. His 1983 album, Rebel Yell, made him into a superstar, with the hit songs Rebel Yell and Eyes Without a Face. 1986's Whiplash Smile further cemented him as one of 1980's biggest artists, with the hit songs To Be a Lover and Sweet Sixteen. In 1987, Billy released a remix album called Vital Idol, which also became a big hit. 
That album had a live version of his cover of the Tommy James and the Shondell song, Money Money. That live version went to number one in America. The 1990s started off on a bad note, though, for Billy, when he was seriously injured in a motorcycle accident. The accident cost him two acting roles, as he was just beginning to take an acting career seriously. He was supposed to have a big role in Oliver Stone's movie, The Doors, about the life of Jim Morrison and The Doors. That role was cut back to a minor role. He was also supposed to be the T-1000 Terminator in Terminator 2 Judgment Day. Due to Billy's accident, though, the role instead went to actor Robert Patrick. Robert Patrick, coincidentally, has his own musical connection. His brother is lead singer Richard Patrick in the group Filter, whose big hits were Take a Picture and Hey Man, Nice Shot. By the way, Robert Patrick nailed the role of the T-1000 perfectly. Great, great movie. Anyway, as Billy was getting better, he released the 1990 album Charmed Life. That album had the Grammy-nominated song Cradle of Love, which was also featured in the Andrew Dice Clay movie The Adventures of Ford Fairlane. Remember Andrew Dice Clay? Wow. Talk about controversy. After that, Billy became a victim of the changing musical landscape, even though he kept putting out albums every few years. Steve Stevens and he went their separate ways, but then they got back together. Then about a decade or so ago, right when 80s music started making a comeback, so did Billy, at least in concerts, as his shows even to these days still routinely sell out. Man's on a tour right now, actually. You should check him out when you get the chance. Great in concert. With the help of his guitarist and writing partner, Steve Stevens, Billy put out eight studio albums. Of those, four hit the top 40 with two of them, Rebel Yell and Whiplash Smile, going top 10. In his native UK, he had five of his albums go top 40, but only Whiplash Smile, for some weird reason, went top 10. Billy's also put out 37 singles. Of those, 10 went top 40 on the United States pop charts with four of those going top 10 and his remake of Moni Moni going to number one, being his only number one hit on the Billboard singles chart. On the Billboard rock charts, though, he did better with 16 going top 40, eight top 10s and Cradle of Love going to number one, not Moni Moni. In the UK, Only 10 went top 40, with three of those going top 10, with the highest only going to number 6, which I find rather strange considering. Billy was also nominated for three Grammy Awards and 10 MTV Video Music Awards back in the days when that actually meant something. He has to date sold over 40 million records worldwide, and he and his sonic assassin Steve Stevens are still out there touring. At 6201 Hollywood Boulevard, in front of the Shake Shack, you will find the star of William Michael Albert Broad, better known as Billy Idol, inducted with the 2,743rd star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame in Hollywood, California, on January 5th, 2023, and we have put his greatest hits on to this week's music podcast playlist as well, the link to which, as I've said before, is in the show notes. The Music Halls of Fame podcast is part of the Music History Today network, which can be found under Music History Today on Spotify, Apple Music, Amazon Music, iHeartRadio, or wherever you get your podcast from, and also on our YouTube page under Music History Today. Thank you very much for listening.